She wants Lydia. <laughs> hey guys, I'll tell you what, Kipling, Vivian May, if you get back to the table, Mr. Hendrick has some milk and cookies for you. <laughs> they were, yeah, they'll get them, trust me. Oh, wow. Um, thank you all so much. It's, uh, it's, it's truly an honor to be here, and I had no idea how that was going to turn out, um, but it was, it was great, obviously. Um, Got to say thanks to, Jan uh, congratulations to Janet, congratulations to Donnie, uh, Jimmy, congratulations to you, brother. Very proud of, they're still running around back there. They'll, they'll get here eventually. But, you know, quite honestly, as, as I was growing up in the Midwest, my father taught me what it meant to have the best race cars, to have a proper maintenance schedule, to never settle for second, and to continuously learn, and to always push the rules. <laughs> so I kind of stuck with that one a lot. Um, and, you know, honestly, when showing up at Rockford Speedway or, or Slinger or the tracks across the Midwest, uh, the competition that we had to face, like Rusty Wallace, Mark Martin, Dick Trickle, uh, we had to be prepared because they were the best and we were racing against them. And this period allowed me to learn from some of the most brilliant car minds, and they taught me the foundation of a race car. But quite honestly, the foundation thing is, is probably something that hits me the deepest, and I'll never forget what my grandparents instilled in me. Work hard from morning until night. Always do what is right and provide for your family. And in the 70s and the 80s, we had a tough racing in the Midwest. Those old school racers, they molded me more than they could ever know. One of my best friends, Jimmy Lauder, who passed away late last year, he gave me $1,000 when I didn't have a dime so that I could move to North Carolina. He never let me give up, and he was always my strongest supporter early in my career. One morning while we were racing at the Short Track Championships at Rockford Speedway, I told Jimmy, I said, I want to move to Charlotte and I want to go NASCAR racing. Jimmy replied, well, Chadwick, he liked to call me Chadwick, it's not my name, but they do like that. He said, I'll help you pack and you will be the best they ever saw. Jimmy would always close a conversation with, I love you, buddy. And man, I love you too. And when we meet up again, I'll pay you back that $1,000. <clears throat> I got to say thank you to my Aunt Linda. Uh, she is a big part of me uh, getting the courage to make all this happen. She gave me the confidence to move away from Rockford, Illinois, with everything that I owned in tow behind a station wagon in a U-Haul trailer. Now, it wasn't much more than a, a clothing basket, a, a motorcycle, and a black and white TV. And, and honestly, I left everything else behind. I wanted to go to Charlotte, and I wanted to start over new. And one of my favorite moments, honestly, when I was working for Stanley Smith in Chelsea, Alabama, we unloaded at Talladega, and uh, Richard Childress was gathering up all the technical inspectors, and he was complaining about the body on a number 49 race car. And I knew at that point, I think I was on the right track. And, and, and we passed technical inspection too, Mr. Heldon. So there you go. I, I vividly remember uh, the race in 1992, uh, Jeff Gordon's first race. And I was with the 49 team, and we were in the garage next to the number 24 car. And they had all these nice new toolboxes, brand new race cars. They had clean uniforms. And here I was, a grungy young man, uh, with a team that we were just hoping to make the race. And I watched Ray Evernham lead that team that weekend, and I was blown away. And I said to myself, one day, one day I want to have that. I want to have those cars. I want to have that team. So in June of 1993, I cold called Hendrick Motorsports. Receptionist picked up and I said, may I speak to Ray Evernham? And she said, sure, just one moment. I was like, did that really just work? <laughs> I don't think that works anymore, just so you guys know. A few moments later, Ray grabbed the phone in his New Jersey accent and he said, hello, this is Ray. And I was frozen for what seemed like seconds to me. And I told Ray who I was and how I had grown up and what I wanted to do. And I could tell he was in a hurry, which he always is. And he said, well, it just so happens that we let a guy go today. Can you be here tomorrow for an interview? And I said, yes. Not knowing how I would pull this off. I didn't know how I was going to drive from Birmingham to Charlotte. I didn't have a car. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know how to tell my boss that I needed to take a day off. So, so I went back to work. I told my boss. I said, hey, got to take tomorrow off. My grandmother is sick, and I have to drive to Wisconsin. And he's like, oh my God, shouldn't you fly? And I was like, no, I'll, I'll be right. I got a friend's car. Um, but nonetheless, obviously, I drove to Charlotte, North Carolina. 
And I arrived late that evening at Hendrick Motorsports. And with my appointment first thing in the morning, I just slept in the car. And I know you guys heard this earlier, but I can remember waking up early the next morning and I'd had a fountain drink in the cup holder. And I used the melted ice to kind of rinse out my mouth and brush my teeth and work on my hair. It wasn't thinning quite as much then, I was working on it. And I put on a new polo and I went in and I spoke to Ray. And Ray asked, he said, well, what do you do? And I told him, I said, I do everything, but I am not a specialist at anything. And, and we bantered back and forth for many minutes and, and honestly, just like what he said, he said, well, where do you want to be in five years? And I thought about it for just a moment and because I was like, this could go a couple of different ways. And I said, in five years, Ray, I want your job. And he smiled at me and he said, be fearful for what you wish for, for you may receive it. And, <laughs> and he said, when can you start? And honestly, I started on July 23rd, 1993, working for that man and that race car driver right there. And it was the coolest thing, man. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. Um, I show up. This is amazing. So you guys remember the Rainbow Warriors, the, 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 the neon, the rainbow, the bright orange. I show up, and they give us this awesome hat and these jackets. And we walk outside, first day on the job, and we take this huge photo with two race cars, a massive transporter, and this team that I thought was massive at the time, although it was only about 13 people. And at that point, I said, I have made it. I have made it. I'm standing here getting my picture taken with this team. Well, as I was walking back into the shop, Michael Landis was standing there and he took back the hat and the jackets and he said, well, let's just hold on and see how this plays out. <laughs> so, fortunately, it went okay. We did all right. Uh, we won in 1994 at Charlotte, uh, Jeff's first win, my first win, Ray's first win in the Cup Series, and then we went on to win a couple of championships together. Uh, very, very awesome. So that was a time I'll never forget. But at that time, there was so much death at Hendrick Motorsports, so many people ahead of me at Hendrick Motorsports that I never thought I would get the opportunity to be crew chief by the time I was 30, and that was my goal. I was 24 years old at that time, and I was like, man, the clock is ticking. So I needed to branch out and if I wanted to be a crew chief in the Cup Series. So I was approached by Dale Earnhardt, and he asked me if I would come to DEI and try to help start that place up. I spoke to Mr. Hendrick. Um, he gave me his blessing to go to DEI if I promised to come back to Hendrick Motorsports if and when the time was right. Now, my tenure at DEI was short, but I learned a lot, and I have so many fond memories of Dale that will remain with me for forever. After that, Ray re soon left Hendrick Motorsports as well to start the Dodge Development Program. And for the second time, Ray Everham gave me my opportunity, and I was able to achieve my goal of becoming a crew chief at the age of 28 which was really awesome. So Ray, thank you for that. I appreciate you giving me that shot. <clears throat> yeah, but this opportunity opened up the door for me to work with Melling Racing and Stacy Compton as a full-time crew chief in the Cup Series in 2001, which is something I will forever be grateful for. That part of my career, we worked like fiends. We did the best we could with what we had, and unfortunately or fortunately, at the end of that se season, Melling was gonna come to a close. And I can remember this, we were in Homestead, and I was talking to one of my best buddies, Jay Guy, and this was just after cup qualifying, and we were just catching up a little bit, and this Bush Series driver walks by. And Jay stopped him and he said, hey, Jimmy, I want you to meet Chad Knaus. This is the guy that I think needs to be your crew chief next year when you go cup racing. I, I never met Jimmy Johnson, I didn't know anything about him other than he had won an Xfinity race or Bush race at the time at Chicago although I did know that he was getting the opportunity of a lifetime to go drive a race car for Rick Hendrick. We shook hands, we kind of laughed it off, and then that was it. Well, the next week, I just happened to run into Diane Dorton, uh, wife of engine builder and pillar of Hendrick Motorsports, Randy Dorton. Diane asked how things were going, and I kind of explained to her where I was, and you know, I was shutting down Melling Racing, and she immediately ran off, and she grabbed Randy. And Randy and I caught up and we, we exchanged words and just chatted for just a little bit. And he said, it was good to see you, we'll, we'll, we'll talk again soon. And a few days later, I get a call from Hendrick Motorsports asking if I wanted to meet with them, Randy and Ken Howes and Brian Weitzel and Robbie Loomis and Jimmy Johnson. And I thought, this is a gag. <laughs> there's no way, there's no way this is really happening right now. So right there and then my journey begins with Jimmy and my second opportunity with Hendrick Motorsports. And what a journey it has been. Qualifying on the pole for the Daytona 500, like the video showed, uh, our first win in Fontana with a strategy call, which I was very proud of, to put Jimmy up towards the front of the field and let him do his magic.
from our first championship in 2006 to our, uh, our record-tying seventh in 2016. My last win as a crew chief with that guy right there and his first win, William Byron at Daytona. That was amazing. And I was, appreciate you, buddy. I was fortunate enough to make the playoffs every season I was a crew chief. And a lot of that credit goes to that guy sitting over there, Ron Malik. Thank you, Ron. You know, the races and the championships and other accomplishments are well documented, but identifying and holding on to the things that really form you are sometimes a little bit harder. Uh, they're not spoken about nearly as much. And the tragedy that struck our sport and our organization in 2004, when family and friends, leadership and future leadership, were lost on the way to Martinsville to watch us do what we do. That was, that was really tough for me. It was tough for all of us. But witnessing firsthand what real strength is and what real leadership is, watching Mr. and Mrs. Hendrick guide our company during that difficult time. But also going through the famous milk and cookies meeting, which I can't wait to go get one here in a minute. Uh, that, that, changed, that changed the way that we did business, business, and that formed up where we were about to go and we didn't have to take a nap. That shift allowed us to become champions. It was great. And we had so many people like Jeff Andrews, who's sitting over there, Jeff Gordon, all of our other partners who have helped influence my life and allowed me to be successful, including everyone at NASCAR, Mr. France, Mr. Helton, all of the NASCAR officials that I've argued with and bickered with over the years, all of you have made me better. My support team with Alan Miller's office and the Norris Group, you guys helped keep me on track and out of trouble. And speaking of trouble, well, Jimmy Johnson has gotten me into and out of a lot of it over my career. And the days of, of riding motorized bar stools, you know, seen those things, like the little engine on them, you drive them around at Lake Norman, or staying up all night drinking on the lake, um, or literally laying on the ground after I've just crashed my dirt bike while Jimmy Johnson is jumping me with his. Yeah, true story. Jimmy helped me find out who I was by believing, honestly, believing in me. Uh, being each other's weddings, being some of the first to meet each other's children. Uh, Jimmy, you have taught me there is much more to life than racing, even if it has taken me many, many years uh, to understand that. I, I wasn't always the best of Jimmy, uh, but I can promise you that I always wanted the best for you, and I will always love you and your family. Mr. and Mrs. Hendricks, so many times, yeah. Thanks. Mr. and Mrs. Hendricks, so many times I have so, come so close to jumping off the tracks, and, and you have done more than your fair share of keeping me out of the ditches and setting me up for success. I truly don't understand why you have had the challenges you endured in life, uh, other than the fact that I know God challenges those that can handle it. The example that you've set with your friendship, your leadership, your generosity, your genuine compassion and love, there is no number of races, no number of championships that I will ever be able to give you to repay what you've done for me and my family. So thank you. I have to mention the fans. You always haven't been, there we go. <laughs> you haven't always been on my side, which is perfectly great. I completely understand that but you've always been there, and that is why we do what we do. You fans are the coolest of any sport, I can tell you that. I want to say thank you real quick. Yeah. We've got a lot of folks here from General Motors, and I want to say thank you. I've been able to win races and championships, go to Le Mans, race the 24 hours of Daytona, all with GM products. So thank you very much for those opportunities. <clears throat> And in 2015, I was married to my lovely and beautiful wife, Brooke. Uh, Jimmy and Shani were there. Uh, it was a very small, select group of friends and family. Uh, it was beautiful on top of a mountain in Telluride, Colorado. The sun was setting, the wind was blowing on that warm August night. And at that point, I knew my life was changing. And it wasn't going to be too long before what I was doing for so long, I wasn't going to be doing much longer. My life was ready to be, become a, a transition phase, I guess is what you would call it. And I wanted to be a husband. I wanted to be a father. And in 2018, we were blessed with my beautiful little boy, Kipling, whom we just saw just a little bit ago. And uh, I can tell you today, 
I thought I had this right. He wanted a Bugatti when he grew up, but he reminded me today it's a Ferrari. No, sorry, a Lamborghini. Let me get that right before he gets back out here. And then two short years later, we were very fortunate to have Vivian May, my beautiful daughter. And quite honestly, you give her a tutu and a princess dress, and she's perfectly happy. Um, I'm excited to see where this is going to take me. I'm excited to see where my future goes. But I always go back to what my grandparents taught me. Work hard from morning until night. Always do what is right and provide for your family. It's an honor to be here tonight. I thank you all. Have a great night. Hi, I'm Parker Kligerman. For more access like this from Pit Road, be sure to click and subscribe to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube channel.